Welcome to uh, the Tucson Festival of Books, the seventh edition. And uh, my name is Ron Barber. I'll be your moderator this afternoon. <laughs> we want to start by thanking Cox Communications for sponsoring the venue and to thank the nation for sponsoring this session. And you might be aware already that there's a table out in the, in the mall uh, for the nation, so you hopefully will stop by. The presentation will be 55 minutes, uh, including questions and answers. So we'd like you to hold your questions till the end. We'll have about a 20, 15, 20 minute uh, session for Q&A. And immediately following the uh, session, the authors will be autographing their books in the U of A bookstore tent on the mall. Uh, that's sponsored by the Arizona uh, bookstores. And books are available also for purchase at this location. Uh, just to uh, uh, point out that uh, Congressman Edwards will be a little bit late to the book signing because he's uh, being interviewed here uh, right after the session by C-SPAN. Uh, if you are enjoying this festival, we encourage you to uh, become a friend of the festival. Your tax-deductible donation allows us to offer festival programming free of charge to the public and to support critical literacy programs here in the, our community. And as you probably know, thousands of dollars have, have come from these festivals over the years to uh, support literacy programs. Uh, you can learn more about the Friends of the Festival Benefits on the information booths on the mall or at the website. We ask if uh, you could turn off your cell phones uh, or put them on vibrate or something that doesn't <coughs> sound off. And um, we will get started with some brief introductions of our panelists this afternoon. We're very uh, privileged to have uh, some amazing folks here today who are uh, commenting uh, with, I think, great insight on the state of American politics and the future of politics in our country. Uh, first member of our panel is uh, former Congressman uh, Mickey Edwards. Uh, Congressman Edwards served in the United States House of Representatives uh, for 16 years. Uh, he served on a Budget and Appropriations Committee and was ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations and a member also of Republican leadership in the House, serving as the chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee. Uh, he is one of three founding trustees of the Heritage Foundation and national chairman of the American Conservative Union. Uh, he has served as co-chairman of a Brookings Institution Council on um, Foreign Relations and the Task Force on Resources for International Affairs. He's also served uh, on the Board of Directors of the Constitution Project and was Director of Congressional Policy Task Forces advising President Reagan during the presidential campaign of 1980. After leaving Congress, he taught at Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government and Harvard Law School for 11 years. He's currently the Vice President of the Aspen Institute and Director of the Aspen Institute Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership. He's also uh, co-founder of No Labels. And his latest book, uh, which is a must read, all of these books are must reads, is this one. Uh, it's called uh, The uh, for Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. It's a very, very good read. <laughs> yeah, he's a... Uh, He's not a musician in, in that sense, but he does know how to do it, I think. Some great ideas in his book. Um, so uh, just we'll close with this comment that apparently in 2008, uh, Congressman Edwards said that he had voted for Barack Obama in the 2008 general election. So you can see from his record history and also his voting record, he's a man who is willing to cross the aisle. Our next panelist is Mark Leibowitz, uh, who is the New York Times chief national correspondent. He came to the Times in 2006 from the Washington Post, where he'd worked for nine years. He is the author of two books that we have uh, today, and uh, they're both uh, really entertaining as well as informative. One is called uh, This Town, uh, which I read uh, when I was in Congress. And, <laughs> He's got a great thing on the back, he says, warning, this town does not contain an index. Those players wishing to know how they come out, came out will need to read the book. <laughs> so smart, you know, good, not, good selling. And then this one, the newest one, is Citizens of the Green Room, Profiles in Courage and Self-Delusion. So you might want to pick that one up too. Uh, <laughs> the original subtitle 
of the first book was The Way It Works in Suck Up City. Uh, his uh, New York Times bestseller, which was the, this town, was called the hottest political book of the summer, containing juicy anecdotes and telltale core of corruption and dysfunction. Uh, he uh, is here with us after having a morning session, which I understand was really outstanding. He was named by the New Republic uh, as one of uh, Washington's 25 most powerful, least famous people. <laughs> Next is John Nichols. Uh, John is a progressive journalist uh, and author. He is a Washington correspondent for The Nation and associate director of the Capital Times. Uh, books uh, co-authored or authored by Nichols include The Genius of Impeachment and The Death of an America and Life of American Journalism. He grew up in Wisconsin, lives in Madison, and uh, he's the editor of the Cap Times in Washington, correspondent for the nation, writes the beat uh, for a blog for magazine, for the magazine. Regular contributor to these in these times, the progressive, and has appeared in documentary uh, films uh, regarding politics. His latest book is called Dollarocracy, How American Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America and other books that he has uh, co-authored with his uh, uh, co-author of this book, Robert McChesney, includes uh, The Life and Death of American Journalism, The Media Revolution That Will Begin the World Again. And our uh, fourth panelist is Lee Fang. Uh, Lee is a reporting fellow, or has been a reporting fellow at the Nation Institute and a contributing writer at the Nation. He's a former senior investigator at the Republic Report and a former investigative blogger for Think Progress. Uh, in college, he was the president of the Federation of Meri uh, Maryland uh, College Democrats and editor of the Maryland Sorry. College Democrat blog. We think we know his politics a little bit. Uh, uh, Fang interned at Think Progress, and as an undergrad, undergrad, he interned on the Hill with Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs-Jones and the current minority uh, whip, Steny Hoyer. Uh, he's published several articles, uh, notably accusations against the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for receiving foreign money to influence American elections, uh, reporting to pull back the curtain on Alan West and his uh, attack on American uh, free speech and journalism, and reporting on the Coke industries. Uh, the book that uh, he wrote uh, just last year is called The Machine, A Field Guide to the Resurgent Right. So we have, as you can tell, people with vast array of experience, different perspectives, uh, but they ha I think they have uh, reached some common uh, conclusions or at least observations about the American political process. And so I'd like to start uh, our discussion uh, this afternoon by posing a broad question to each of them, each of them respond, and we'll get into some of the specifics uh, of their perspective. Uh, the question is, how is the introduction of virtually unlimited financial campaign contributions, the 24-hour uh, news cycle, everything is breaking news, uh, and American social media, uh, which is proliferating the political process now, as it even wasn't even present uh, four years ago in, in this regard. And uh, how are these um, uh, activities, uh, this uh, work, how, how has it affected American politics in uh, the 2014 election? Uh, perhaps the last two election cycles, and how are these factors likely to impact uh, on the 2016 election? So uh, let me start with uh, Congressman Edwards. Would you care to comment on, on this question? Which one? Uh, that, that covered the whole thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, for, first of all, I have to say congratulations on trouncing Oregon. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, my, my greatest hope right now is that my Oklahoma Sooners don't have to play Arizona, you know, until the, at least till the finals. Um, you know, the, the, the role of uh, money and, and media uh, have totally changed over the time that uh, I was in the House and in a very negative way in, in both cases. The, um, I, I'm a lawyer, so I, I'm cautious about saying a thing like this. I don't want to get in trouble with the Supreme Court. But when they passed Citizens United, I don't know what they were smoking, but it's not legal except in Colorado. Um, the, uh, 
uh, uh, clearly there's Legal a, a, a DC, strong distinction, but yeah, in DC, yeah. a strong distinction between uh, corporations and um, individuals, which they would have known if they ever studied uh, corporate law. But um, <laughs> there, there really is a, a serious problem, and I, you know, I can personalize. I mean, you know, when, when a billionaire casino owner in Las Vegas can make an idiot like Newt Gingrich look like he's a possible serious candidate. There's something really wrong. Um, but what, what we have here is it's, it's not just the outside money having such an undue influence on the elections. What it is is also the fact that members of Congress are under such pressure now, you know, to raise the enormous obscene amounts of money it takes to win even a U.S. House race. Uh, that just individual contributions from people like you just get, you know, so overwhelmed that your voice is, is not muted, but, but it's really uh, greatly reduced. But I also think that, you know, the, I, I am not against uh, partisan media. I've actually written for the nation as well as for um, publications on the other side uh, of the issues, but I, I am not, uh, I'm not uh, a fan of violence. I won't go to see a violent movie. Uh, but I have said that I, the only violence I've ever advocated is to take Rush Limbaugh and Keith Olbermann and put them in a bag and drop them into the river together. Uh, I mean, because there's so much toxicity being poured in uh, on the networks now that what's happened is uh, instead of just somebody being on the other side, somebody you would maybe vote differently then and then eventually you, you go out and, and have a friendly relationship with, now it's, it's just somebody who thinks differently than you. This is not, by the way, not just among members of Congress. It's among people generally. Yeah. You know, an unwillingness to listen to uh, a different point of view. And I, everybody in this room is an exception. But outside, outside of you, most people, you know, only hang out with the, their friends who think just like they do, watch the same shows they watch, you know, vote the same way they watch. Uh, so I, I think in terms of what's happened in both the media, Ron, and money, uh, they've been big contributing factors to the fact that we can't seem to get anything done in Washington anymore. I wish you were still there, by the way. <laughs> so, Mark, what do you, what's your take on this? I, I know you've well, written about the incestuous relationship between the media, Cong members of Congress and lobbyists, and uh, interesting to know how you take this, uh, well, take a look at this. Well, yeah, let, let's put the, the media, I, I don't think we're going to solve the problem of the American media, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, my head is just not that, I, 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 I'm going to just sort of start with, with pol money in the political system. I mean, I, I think I would broaden it to not just be money in campaigns. I think that the, the biggest difference in Washington now compared to, say, 30, 40 years ago has been <laughs> the introduction of this permanent, you know, th this very well-funded permanent political class in Washington. Now, there have always been permanent, you know, political, you know, people in Washington. But companies have decided that it is now very good business for them to spend, you know, billions of dollars, you know, to lobbyists, to super PACs, to try to influence, you know, the movement of one decimal point in a tax bill that may or may not be ever realized. But I, I think <clears throat> you mentioned the Shell and Adelson example. I mean, the fact that Mitt Romney can name Paul Ryan his running mate mm -hmm. in 2012. Uh, traditionally, when when a party picks its running mate, the running mate will make you know courtesy calls upon maybe party leaders, members of Congress, uh, go back to his home district, you know, go you know say do something. The immediate first thing that Paul Ryan did was fly out to Las Vegas. This is what. You know, every Republican in this case candidate, but you know, Democrats would do it to have done. And and also, once you get into office, the the overwhelming mechanism once you're there is self perpetuation. It's how do I stay here, and stay here, including you know, how do I stay in office? But even if I leave office, how am I going to make sure that I stay in Washington at a very, very, very well paying job afterwards? I mean, no one goes home anymore. I mean, with some very, very, very few exceptions. So. You know, that, that creates a system where you have members of Congress spending, you know, 20, sometimes 30, 40 hours a week raising money. That might be low. I mean, uh, I mean, some of the most depressing news stories you'll ever read or memos you'll ever read is, are, are those that just talk about the hammerlock that fundraising has on the life of every, pretty much on every elected official, um, you know, working in Washington today. So, look, I mean, th this, 
this piece has a million components. I mean, one of the another depressing thing is that no one's talking about campaign finance, at least in Congress anymore. It doesn't seem to be a campaign issue. I think if you talk to a lot of people, they'd say it's the single biggest ill on on the face of the the body politic, and I would certainly agree with that. So. Mark, you're so right about the time spent. You know, 25, 30 hours a week is the norm for members to be in call time, and uh, not something that I think most of us pr appreciated, but it's became essential to compete. Do you miss so, call time? Yeah. What? Do you miss call time? I do not miss call time yeah. at all. In fact, I was back there in January, and I went to call the call room just to see some if anyone was there. And here it was, January 16th, and there were people calling for, for dollars for 2016. Not good. John, what's your take on this, please? Well, I'm, I'm going to correct Mark. I'm sorry, because he was wrong. Some members do come home. <laughs> Whether That's they true. like it or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, a lot of them come home, but then they go back. No, I just, they, I just know that, that Ron is with us today. He's, uh, oh, he's oh, that found is his true. way to oh, Tucson. Yeah, 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 they do. I, I, I I, it, it's the only place where I could think you were inaccurate, but you know, he is yeah. here with us. That's fine. You're right. But no. There's a reason they, they put Washington where it is. They wanted to find a swamp. And, and I have no patience whatsoever with people who say, wow, they've made Washington worse. It was awful 40 years ago. It was, uh, this is a place that gave you Vietnam. Come on. I mean, this, this is a town that has a deep, long history of awfulness. And it, it, now they've, all they've done is professionalized it. They've gotten really, really good at being awful. And, and here's, here's the thing to understand. Once upon a time, politics existed beyond Washington. It existed in this place called America. And you had local newspapers and local radio stations, local TV stations that gave you something other than the weather. And, and you know, we actually had some sort of discourse in America. That's over. That's done. The fact of the matter is they have collapsed our politics into Washington so much that we actually think we have a media system in America. We still think we have you know, free press and media in America. But the fact of the matter is that it is basically gossip in Washington, looking at the people who are there. And out in the rest of the country, staggeringly limited coverage of anything that isn't happening in Washington. And so our brilliance is not bubbled up there. Their stupidity is pushed down upon us. And the money does it. And this is an important thing to understand. You know, most members of Congress know whether they're going to win at the start of an election year. It's not a debatable point. I have a friend, Rob Ritchie, with the center. Uh, I guess they, now they call it fair vote. Uh, and Rob Ritchie, every year, predicts every congressional race in the country. And rarely does he get more than one or two out of the 435 wrong. So all the coverage of the whole year, you could just go to Rob. And he could tell you what was going to happen. And you know what he does? He says. About 90% of the districts are gerrymandered beyond competition, right? So there isn't going to be competition in most of America. And that is not done gently by like some, you know, guy with green eye shade going down a list or something like that. No, no, it's computerized. People with tens of millions of dollars ta have taken over the gerrymandering process and professionalized it. And so they professionalized corruption and they professionalized the antithesis of democracy, right? Because you're creating non-competitive districts. That's number one. Number two, um, they have flooded Washington with lobbyists. When Bob and I did our book, we charted the number of lobbyists in Washington. It, you know, it used to be, and this is when Ronald Reagan came to the White House, ancient history, used Thanks to be, a lot. there was a, <laughs> I was covering it. <laughs> there was a one-on-one -on -one ratio, right? You had about a one-on-one -on -one ratio of PR, lobbying, you know, to journalists, right? When we, chart, when we were charting about four years ago, it was now about a four and a half to one ratio, right? So we now have four and a half people trying to spin the thing versus one person trying to get any kind of truth out. And that one person, by the way, is part of a newspaper that has cut staff, doesn't cover things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So flood of lobbying. This is the key, though. The money that has come in is only about this tiny number of places where there might be any kind of chance that the people's voice might possibly be heard. And yet they're terrified of you. They're horrified 
that you people might actually come along and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to play by their rules this time. I think I'm going to elect somebody who might actually be useful. And so what they do, they don't spend the money on campaigns to influence politicians. The politicians are already influenced. They're already, that, that, that process is done. And they represent a district where if they stepped out of line, by and large, they would be primaried by somebody who would be in line. Because it's not the general election, it's the primary that matters. So here's what the money does. It tells you not to vote. And that's a critical thing. We've got to get as, the people out as much as we can. And so we now have, last, last elections, yeah, midterm elections, 36% turnout in the United States of America. 36% turnout. If you meet three people, two of them didn't vote. And it's declining. We had the lowest turnout in a midterm election last year since 1942. And many of you who know about World War II will recognize that in 1942, a lot of Americans were otherwise involved. <laughs> and so what you're talking about is we are collapsing small d democratic participation. And I'll close off by telling you how it's done. Every campaign of consequence is driven by negative ads. Negative ads which tell you not to vote for somebody. Now, the average person is not as involved in politics as Mickey Edwards. And so as a result, they're not like charting everything and looking at all the detail. All they do is they turn their television on, turn their radio on. It says, don't vote for Lee. OK, cool, I got that. Check, not vote for Lee. And don't vote for his opponent, Mark. OK, check that, don't vote. And so they're like, oh, OK, I get it. There's no one to vote for. And you understand the dynamic that we have created is a process drenched in money with little competition, and then all of our messaging around elections, don't vote. And people take that seriously. But you won't fully get what I'm trying to say unless I give you a closing metaphor. And so I will say, all of my friends in you know conservative, not all, Mickey, wonderful. He's not even a conservative anymore, but he was once one. <laughs> they all say, we've got to run government like a business. So let's run campaigns like a business, all right? So if we ran campaigns like a business, Monday morning, Coca-Cola would put up a new ad. And they'd say, we regret to inform you of all the health violations over at the Pepsi plant. And Monday afternoon, Pepsi would come on and say, in response to the scurrilous ads from Coca-Cola, we are going to have to tell you about a Coke plant that had vermin. And the next morning, Pepsi would be up saying, Coca-Cola gives you diabetes. And that afternoon, Pepsi's up going to say, Coke makes you fat, or whatever. I'm, I'm losing the metaphor here, but Pepsi makes you fat. Bottom line is, by the end of the week, no one would drink Pepsi or Coke. What money in politics does, what the money in politics is doing, is creating a circumstance where the overwhelming majority of Americans will not partake of politics. We are creating a plutocracy. We are destroying the country. So that's my answer to your question, Ron. Thanks. But there is hope, right? <laughs> we'll talk about that. Yeah, there's Lee, hope you, because they're going to go out and organize and amend the Constitution of the United States and overturn Citizens United because that's what we have that's to do. What we have to do. Okay. Well, Lee, uh, in your book, I think you've done a really incredible job. I, I, I enjoyed reading it immensely, uh, uh, digging into the history of the conservative, I would say, extreme right wing uh, money people in our country and what, how they've influenced uh, politics. Uh, so from your perspective, as you looked at that machine, as you described, uh, what do you see, what did you see happening in the last election and midterms, and what do you see uh, might be happening in 2016? Sure, and um, thanks for having me, and it's great to be on this panel. Uh, just the role of, of big money in politics is really everywhere. We, we talk about campaigns, elections, but it, it's so much more than that. It, it creates perverse incentives in politics. It manipulates what you see and don't see in the media. Even here, in, my, in, your, in your introduction of me, there, a quick correction. You know, um, uh, some of the, the firms that I have uh, reported on, they've, they've hired PR companies to manipulate my Wikipedia bio, which is what you used to introduce me. And that's, not, that's inc incorrect and incomplete. I'm a reporter with uh, The Intercept. Um, if you go into the history of the Wikipedia, you can see the, the kind of uh, the manipulation there. In any case, um, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the symbiotic relationship between big money and the media. Um, 
we, we like to think that our media holds the big money accountable, but in, in many cases it's the other way around. It's, it's actually a reinforcing uh, factor. So for McCain-Feingold, uh, as many will recall, uh, the, big, the last big campaign finance reform push, um, there was a, a provision to give candidates free airtime so that you didn't have to make, do that, that, that call time of begging for dollars. Um, but the National Association of Broadcasters, um, the lobby group for NBC and News Corp, they actually stripped that out of the bill because they, they like the big money uh, into the system because they're buying the ads. You know, they're, they're enriching the big media companies. And even in the last um, kind of minor push for a little bit of transparency, um, the FCC in the 2000, right, up, right before the 2012 election, had a, a, a tiny regulation to ask broadcasters to disclose um, the forms of who's buying the political ads. Not who's paying for them, but just who's making the purchases of those, you know, Americans for Apple Pie or whatever, Super PAC. And who fought this regulation? Uh, it was the media companies, the, the big media companies across this country, including um, the corporate owner of Politico, one of the, the biggest um, political outlets in D.C., fought this tooth and nail. Uh, it still went through, but it, it's worth noting. And, you know, you, you look in D.C., you, you know, I lived there for a number of years, and um, this culture of corruption, the, the, the fact that no one goes home, that, as Mark was mentioning, um, this is fostered by the D.C. media. You're a loser. Um, if you are a congressman and you go work at a, a, a watchdog agency or you, you go and work as a professor, you're a winner, you're someone cool if you go and work for a, a lobbying firm, um, if, if you're featured in Washington Life, if you're uh, featured in the Hill newspaper's top guns of top grossing lobbyists, if you take on um, you know, a dict uh, you know, the Egyptian dictatorship or one of these other uh, uh, Middle East regimes as a lobbying client, you're seen as, as a big winner, you're invited to all the big parties. And the DC media is part of that, right? Because they'll they'll feature you as one of the top hired guns of you know fall of 2014. There's 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 a whole series on this in, in the DC media, so so that's a big problem. And uh, we just the the way that we kind of portray uh, big money in politics, the role of, of lobbying. You you, look, you watch television and you see the lobbyists on, on television who are are giving you the news, um, but they're not disclosed as lobbyists. They're they're, they're portrayed as independent Republican or Democratic strategists um, when in fact they're, they're working for the industries that they're talking about. You know, Alex Castellanos on CNN is come, brought on as a Republican strategist talking about corporate taxes, but it's not disclosed that his lobbying firm, Purple Strategies, works for the same corporate interest that doesn't want um, a, a hike in the corporate tax rate. Or on Fox News, you see the Fox News military analyst, Jack Keane. He's on almost every night. If you turn Fox News on this week, I'm sure you'll see him. It's not disclosed that he works for General Dynamics, one of the largest defense contractors in this country. And when he's demanding that we sell more tanks and weapons to uh, different Middle East regimes, um, he might have a, a conflict of interest there. I don't know. Um, and, you know, there, there are many very simple um, actions our government can take to reform this problem, but the media gives them no, no airtime. You know, I, I, I want to recall this one moment last year when Obama wore a yellow a uh, suit jacket on TV, yeah. that was the coverage the whole day. I look at this weird jacket that he wore. It's, 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 it's an off-color tan. It's, it's really unfashionable or something. But that, that, that one scene was given uh, more airtime than a single executive order that Obama could take um, to really clean up um, uh, the dark money uh, political problem that we have. He could issue an executive order with a stroke of a pen that forces um, government contractors to disclose their secret money donations to these 501c4, c6 groups that have flooded um, our, our election system with um, undisclosed campaign cash, but he doesn't, and the media doesn't even give any coverage to these issues. Well, thank you, Lee. I want to, yeah, I wanted to uh, to move in the remaining time we have to having each of you talk from the perspective of your examination of the political process. What, what we can do about this, you know, we. I think there's a general consensus in our panelists that we've got a serious problem. I think most of us agree that we have with money, uh, the media, uh, you know, being uh, very uh, well off because of the political money that goes into advertising and so on. So, so Mickey, could you talk a little bit about the institutional reforms that you've proposed in your book, which have to do with reforms in how Congress operates, um, and and comment if you could about the the influence or the uh, uh, the pressure, if you will, that uh, members of Congress get from their party leadership to toe the line. 
When I was uh, when I was in the House, uh, you, you said this, Ron, in the introduction. I, I was the ranking member of the subcommittee on foreign operations, and the uh, subcommittee on foreign operations has many tasks. One of them is uh, it's the it's the subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee that decides who gets foreign aid, how you know how much foreign aid you spend and, and who gets it. Uh, there is a bias, and, and I think it's the proper bias, uh, in favor of giving American tax dollars to democracies rather than to non-democracies. So I imagined this scenario. Uh, if, if a country was being considered for U.S. foreign aid, and it was a country that held elections, they, they, they held free elections, uh, and they were competitive elections, but they had set up, if you really looked at it, they had set up a system whereby relatively small groups of the population, in some cases as small as, you know, one-tenth of one percent, mm -hmm. you know, could keep other people off the ballot. Mm -hmm. And they could also uh, draw a plan so that people who were unlikely to vote against, them, who were unlikely to vote for them, would not be allowed to vote in that election. And I would ask crowds, you know, when I talk about, would you give foreign aid to that country? It's the United States. That, that is our political system. I gave a talk once and I described what it, what it was that I saw in our system. Uh, and somebody said, oh, you're a systems engineer. Yes. Yeah. You know, the problem is, the, the problem is that it's not that we elect stupid people. It's not that we elect mean people who don't care about the yeah. country. It's that we have created a political system, not a constitutional system, a political system which allows the political parties. So I, 46 states, 46, including Arizona, have laws that say that if you ran for your party's uh, nomination in a primary or mm -hmm. con a convention and you didn't get your nomination, you are not allowed to be on the ballot in November, which means, you take an example in Utah where they had a convention and Robert Bennett, Senator Robert Bennett, kind of a moderate conservative, was running for uh, re-election of the Senate. Uh, they had a convention with 3,500 people there in a state of 3 million people. Uh, by a very small number of votes, he lost the nomination in that convention, and he was not allowed to be on the ballot in November when he would have overwhelmingly been elected to the U.S. Senate, where he would have a vote on Supreme Court nominees and whether to go to war and all these other things. So we have created a political system uh, that allows the parties to control access to the ballot, to draw district lines to benefit their club. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I'm a city dude. I mean, I really am. To me, uh, you know, food either comes from a, a grocery store or a waiter. And, uh, I, uh, but I was the first Republican elected in my district since 1928. Uh, and it was a heavily Democratic state with a heavily Democratic legislature. They didn't like it very much. So they redistricted me finally after a couple of attempts to beat me. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the Republicans and put them in his district uh, to make the other districts safer for the other for their party. Uh, the result of it was me, the city dude. Mm -hmm. I was now representing tens of thousands of wheat farmers and cattle ranchers. I didn't understand their issues. I didn't really care about their issues. I mean, I, that's not not my area of interest because the political parties in this country have the ability to draw congressional district lines to suit the benefit of their party and screw the voters. And, and that's our system. It's a system in almost every state. There are 13 states that now have some form of uh, nonpartisan redistricting. Um, and, and you all had a chance. You had a chance to do what Washington and uh, California did uh, and to get rid of party control of who can be on the ballot, and you blew it. You blew it. You know, uh, and, and so what we have to do is change the system so that we don't allow, I'm not anti-political party. I am appalled by the idea that we have laws that allow political party insiders, party hacks, mm -hmm. ideologues to decide who you can vote on. And so it's going to require, you know, really serious thing. One, one quick thing, Ron, you asked about inside Congress. We allow... Uh, party leaders to decide what committee you can be on, where this, these are the choke points of legislation, and you get on the committee in exchange for two things. One is raising enough money, you know, for your own party, 
and the other is promising your party leaders that on the major issues you're going to vote in line with the party you know before you've even seen a bill so i mean i can't don't even how can i describe all the reforms i wrote a book about it but anyway uh, but but well uh, i want to just before we leave you me. mickey on this you mentioned arizona and of course uh, arizona's independent redistricting committee uh, commission uh, did in fact give us more competitive legislative districts and congressional districts uh, and now, of course, the Supreme Court has taken it up as a question of constitutionality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it was it was poorly drawn, Ron, because you think the, that's other, the, other 13, the other 13 states have some role uh, for the legislature, which is what the Constitution requires. Uh, and when it was done in Arizona, it was done in a way that did not allow that. And that's, that's what makes it now vulnerable. They, you know, they haven't ruled yet, but it makes it vulnerable constitutionally. Right. Okay. So you can go back and, re and fix that pretty easily. If we get another initiative, I would guess. Yeah. Mark, let's talk about uh, your point of view on this. Well, um, first, I want to know why a, how a city dude got elected in Oklahoma to begin with. <laughs> so, I guess Tulsa, Oklahoma City. Or no. Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, it, it's a great question. I mean, I, one of the interesting experiences I had after I wrote this town was one of the overwhelming <laughs> responses I got from people was, wow, that was really entertaining and really funny, but boy, did it fill me with despair. Yeah. And I would go out and I was, I was promoting the book, and when the paperback came out, um, you know, the single biggest, most common question I got from people, you know, especially outside of Washington, was, uh, so what's the source of hope? You know, what can we do? Uh, which was in itself very encouraging. I mean, it, it shows that audiences like this, audiences like virtually all, all that I came before, and I'm sure people up here would have similar experiences, you know, have that question still at the forefront of their mind. And I, I would say this. I mean, if there's one thing we've learned over and over and over again, that despite this dysfunction, despite the money we're talking about, despite the utter perversity of what is actually legal in the system today, the legalized bribery that, that so much of, you know, campaign and lobbying is, um, is, and I said this earlier, Washington actually does respond to self-interest, especially when you know it puts the fear of God in them. And you know, Barack Obama began as a grassroots movement. The Tea Party began as a grassroots movement. We're talking far left, far right, maybe. Um, I mean, this is not a partisan thing at all. And look, I mean, one of the pet issues I have is that, that a lot of what goes on in Washington and a lot of the money that goes on in Washington, that, that is spent in Washington, is geared towards things not getting done. Mm -hmm. um, if an immigration bill passes tomorrow, um, it would be despite, you know, billions of dollars being thrown into to thwarting it. But also, I mean, the day-to-day -day business is, you know, those lobbying fees that are not going to be realized, those shouting matches on cable that are not going to occur if consensus is made and, and a bill passes. But I, I guess, and this always sounds a little Pollyannish, but it always gets heads to nod, it, it's that, you know, the, the self-interest we're talking about is, I mean, it is enacted through candidates that actually can appeal to hope, through movements that can appeal to actually some kind of reform. I mean, I think, you know, in so much as Rand Paul has support on the right or within the Republican Party, I think, you know, a part of the appeal is that he is selling a different paradigm. I think Elizabeth Warren on the left, I mean, the, the, the hankering for her, I mean, I, I said earlier, I don't think a lot of people know her that well, but I think she represents something different from, in the case of from the Democrats, the Clintons. Um, and look, gun control got close a couple of years ago. Um, the reason is there was a level, I mean, you, know, you can talk about gun politics and gun lobbying you know, forever, and it, that's a very depressing topic. But, um, you know, especially in a place like Tucson, which has experienced this in a very, very palpable way, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the grassroots is where a lot of this starts. And, and the change is not, you know, every day. But, um, you know, I have seen over and over again that, that the actual voices at the grassroots are extremely powerful and can be if organized correctly and leveraged correctly. I think there's a great segue for John because, John, I think, uh, you know, your major thrust is we need a reform movement in this country like we've had in the past. And yet we've heard today and we know uh, from what we've read that the forces against that are formidable. So how do, you, how do you propose that we actually get something like that going so we can make these changes from the people as opposed to the politicians? Well, let me, let me first say that Mickey's book is great. And the stuff he's talking about is fabulous. 
Um, and I would say that if you want anything that Mickey wants, you do what I tell you to do. Uh, so, very simple calculation here, brothers and sisters. It is absolutely absurd with the Supreme Court that we have today to suggest that you are going to pass and put into place meaningful campaign finance reforms. It is absolutely absurd to sit around and wait on the possibility that the right person gets elected and the right person leaves the court and maybe you'll tip the balance someday. That is an anti-democratic premise. What that says is, we're, it's a mess, we all agree it's a disaster, and so we're all gonna just sit and wait till something good happens. Wrong. The fact of the matter is that this country's had a lot of problems through its history. We were founded at the original sin of human bondage. We decided eventually that we would give African American men after the Civil War the right to vote. Then we realized women didn't have the right to vote. We thought, well, that's a pretty bad thing too. We gave women the right to vote. Then we thought, well, you know what? It's a pretty bad idea that we have a wealth barrier to voting. So we eliminated the poll tax. And then we thought, well, you know what? It's a pretty bad idea that we send 18 to 21 year olds off to die in wars in places like Vietnam, and we don't let them vote. So we gave vote to 18 to 21 year olds. We did every one of those things by amending the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution was not handed down, written in stone to Michelle Bachmann. The fact of the matter is, it's an amendable document. And if we are serious about anything we are saying, anything we are saying on this table, everyone in this room has to recognize that it is our fundamental duty to amend the Constitution of the United States to say money is not speech, corporations are not people, and we have a right to organize elections where our votes matter more than their dollars. That's the bottom line thing we have to do. And the good news is, you don't have to start anything, Ron. 600 American communities have already formally demanded that Congress take that action. 16 American states have formally demanded that Congress take that action. When it is put on the ballot, the people vote for it. In 2012, it was on the ballot in Colorado and Montana. Colorado voted for Obama, Montana voted for Romney. They both gave almost 75% support to money is not speech, corporations are not people, we have a right to real elections in this country. And so the bottom line is we could talk about all this other stuff, but everybody in this room and anybody watching beyond here, the bottom line is you got to stop worrying about parties and stop worrying about candidates and start worrying about democracy itself. If we could amend the Constitution to give African-American men the right to vote after the Civil War, if we could amend it to give women the right to vote, if we could amend it to get rid of a poll tax, if we could amend it to give 18 to 21 year olds the vote, if we could amend it to create an elected rather than an appointed United States Senate, then brothers and sisters, unless we are dramatically less than our grandparents and our great grandparents, we can amend it to get big money out of politics, period. That's hopeful. Let me, uh We'll, uh, we'll just wrap up the, uh, the panelists' uh, uh, comments and then go to Q&A just in a moment. But uh, Lee, I wanted to uh, turn to you at the end here. Um, I have to say, uh, you, you, I think you nailed it with your history of uh, how money and right-wing politics go hand in hand. I was somewhat disappointed at the end. I, you seem very pessimistic about change. In fact, you <laughs> quote uh, Jefferson saying, uh, that Jefferson's dark vision of an American governed not by the people, for the people, and by the people, but ruled instead by a small, selfish oligarchy is coming true because of the conservative machine. What's the way out? I mean, we've heard from others that there are some ways. What, what's your take on that? Thank you so much for reading the book. You're part of a, an elite few, so. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that, seriously. It's a great um, book. You ought to read it. Oh, everyone. Um, you know, he, I actually take take issue, um, and, and not to call you out, Mark, at all, because this is kind of right. what, what many folks say, but the conventional wisdom is that all of this big money sloshing around our system is legalized. You know, this is all legal corruption. That's the scandal, what's actually legal. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I don't think we have a cop on the beat. You know, the Office of Congressional Ethics um, hasn't really lifted a finger in many, many years. You know, they, when they're submitted evidence of congressional corruption, um, they have a mandate to investigate, 
and they do investigate, and eventually um, they do release the, 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 the documents relating to that investigation. And you, you see these, these things come out of that office that show pretty clear uh, evidence of corruption. I mean, there's, there's one that was released by the office last fall of um, a Kentucky congressman whose wife is a lobbyist, and they, they actually released the emails, and the, the wife is saying, hey, sign on to this bill, do this, do that. I mean, it's pretty clear rule breaking, but as usual, the Office of Congressional Ethics did nothing. Um, you know, we have an FEC, as I mentioned on the panel yesterday, that has not lifted a finger uh, to investigate a multitude, real mountains of evidence that have been given to them of uh, campaign finance law breaking. Why? Because it's a deadlock, three to three Republican Democrat um, commission, and they, they, you know, refuse to do anything. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, we have a Department of Justice that has not taken a look at um, lots of evidence of uh, political elites breaking the law. They, they'll investigate city councils, state legislatures, even governors, but they won't touch um, Congress, and it, it, it's, it's very bewildering. We, we did a story at The Nation last year uh, that uh, took a look at lobby disclosure law. You know, for a long time we've had the LDA that says if you don't register, if you're engaged in lobbying activities and you don't register, um, that's, you know, that, that's a, a civil penalty. And then when Democrats, quote unquote, drain the swamp after the Abramoff scandal, they added criminal penalties if you don't register. But we, did a, we had a scoop that showed that the, the Department of Justice has never brought an enforcement action under that law ever, under Bush or Obama. So do we know if there's legal or illegal corruption? We don't, because we don't have a cop on the beat. Our, our political elites are, are, are face an unequal, or they don't, they don't have the same um, justice system that everyone else has. You know, we have an FBI that monitors um, peaceful domestic protesters um, but we don't, but they're not taking a look at these political elites that are probably breaking the law. So, you know, I, there's been a lot of calls by elites and, and people in the media for just sweeping new, um, you know, campaign finance laws and congressional ethics reforms. I'm not so optimistic about that. I don't trust Congress, given the state of affairs today, to police itself and to reform itself. I think we need to have a more equal justice system where our law enforcement officials, our Department of Justice, our FBI is taking a look at Congress. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, let's go uh, as quickly as we can to as many questions as possible. The microphone's down at the bottom of the uh, uh, auditorium. If you could state your question, not a comment, if you will, please. A quick question, and then we'll ask uh, if you want to direct it to a particular panelist, do so. If you want them all to respond, that's fine, too. So let me go over here. Hi. Thank you all for your time today. Um, I'm hoping you can talk about voting rights um, sure. uh, and uh, ID laws and uh, the efforts that are being made to keep people from voting. Yeah. I can go ahead. Go ahead. Mark, why don't you go? Uh, no, you, you go for it. Go. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's, it's an unbelievably horrible circumstance. And the same court that says that that corporations can spend pretty much as much money as they like on politics, and now rich people under McCutcheon can spend as much money wherever they want, are saying that, you know, we don't want to make it too easy to vote. And so we, we actually have an, an incredible mess. And we have so corrupted the process in Washington that the people who a few years ago got across every line of, of partisanship to support the Voting Rights Act, now we can't get them to even you know, consider the thing again. So it's an absolute disaster. And, and here is the thing that frustrates the heck out of me on it. The Republican Party, founded by people who you know, were ready to, to take on all the great challenges in this, not all of them, but a lot of them in this country, and that through the 1950s and the 1960s was absolutely a good player as regards civil rights and voting rights. You look at who voted for the Voting Rights Act. There's a lot of Republicans who were really providing that critical mass. This party currently lacks leadership on this issue. And it is, I'm not, I am not interested in the partisanship of it because the Democratic Party is often an absolute and indefensible disaster on a whole host of issues. But at this point, the party of Lincoln is refusing to stand with James Sensenbrenner, an incredibly conservative Republican from Wisconsin who has come forward with a, a good voting rights act, a good new bill. And so what I would suggest to you is go and find your Republican representatives. I'm serious. I know I, some people will say, oh, it's hard to communicate or it's hard to get. Go and find them and look at them, look them in the eye 
and say, how can you, as the party of Lincoln, as the party that actually did back civil rights, how can you not get on board for this? And at the same time, uh, one final thing. I absolutely agree with those who say that voter ID is a new poll tax. The fact of the matter is you gotta pay for an ID, you gotta pay for something like that, and we have a constitutional amendment from 1964 that banned the poll tax. And once again, as Lee says, if we had a cop on the beat, voter ID laws would be getting knocked out like that. So, an answer, but not, not a happy one. Let's go over here. Um, uh, Ron Barber notwithstanding, with the incredible um, dysfunction and paralysis of Congress, why should we care who gets elected? Uh, I, I would say that, I would say that um, because of the incredible dysfunction in Congress, <laughs> that's why you should care about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, there, there is, I mean, the argument for despair and doing absolutely nothing is made pretty eloquently every single day. Um, just turn on your TV, you know, read the internet. Um, look, I mean, Congress is not a singular entity. It's, it's made up of people, I mean, just like the media. I mean, everyone says, well, the media doesn't care about this, the media is this. I mean, I mean look, it's ultimately um, politics is, our, you know, unlike corporations, you could say, politics are people. And, um, you know, that's your last recourse. You know. I mean, uh, go it ahead. might sound Pollyannish. But. Can I add something to that? Uh, why should you care? Uh, well, there's two reasons. Well, first of all, uh, we're talking here about Congress being dysfunctional. It's not dysfunctional. If you get in your car in the morning and you put in the key in the ignition and you turn it and the car comes to life, it's functional. It's working the way it's designed to work. Same thing if you use your remote on your TV. So, so the Congress is functioning according to the design, and the design needs to be changed, which is why uh, we need to make fundamental laws about primaries and about redistricting and also that the, the system's different. But why should you care? Uh, everybody, again, in this room is an exception, but if you went out on the, the mall out here and you talked to people and you said, <laughs> who's the head of government in the United States? You know, they'd say Barack Obama, or and earlier it would have been George W. Bush or Bill, no. We don't have a head of government in the United States. We have equal branches, except that every major power of our government is in Congress, including the, the war power, the spending power, the taxing power. You know, who can sit in the president's cabinet? Who, who can be his secretary of state? What treaties can be, for? all of this is congressional power. That's why it matters. It matters like crazy because, you know, a president may come and go, but what Congress does in acts into law can really make a fundamental change one way or the other for good or bad in this country. Uh, the, the idea that people, you know, don't vote in off year elections because they say, well, the president's not on the ballot. Who cares? You, you change Congress and you'll fix it. So that's, that's why it matters. But you know, one thing I was going to ask you to comment on too, Mickey, that uh, you've suggested in your book that one way to, ref many institutional reforms, but one way in particular would be to have the speaker actually elected by the House, not just by the party. Right. And I mean, it seems like an impossible climb to me, but why don't you say a little bit about that? Well, I think most people are not aware that the Speaker of the House doesn't even need to be a member of the House. I mean, you, you could pick Oprah to be the Speaker <laughs> if you want. Uh, you know, but, and, 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 and the, the reason for that is that what we have, we do not have in either party, House or Senate legislative leaders, we have party hacks. You know, Boehner is a party hack, Pelosi is a party hack, Mitch is, Harry Reid is, they all, they're, they're motivated by what helps their party, not by how do you make the legislative system work. So what I suggested in some countries, Britain and Canada, uh, in Britain you cannot be elected Speaker of the House of Commons unless you're nominated by members of more than one party. You know, and, and so we, we should just make it where you can't get just a straight party line vote and be Speaker. Let's go to our next questioner. So Barney Frank in his book on Dodd-Frank suggested that he thought lobbyists served a useful function by providing information that they would not otherwise have and points of view that were important to hear. So I'm wondering if you think they, uh, it is all bad or do they in fact serve a useful function? And the other side of the question is do you actually think members of Congress vote a certain way because of money? Who wants to take that one question? I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick shot um, at part of it. Well, you know, of course, 
industry needs to be represented. They need a voice. But you know, as we mentioned before, they're, they're not regulated. Uh, lobbyists are, are not uh, following the rules, and they're not being prosecuted for not following the rules. And you know, Congress, since the Gingrich era, has really hollowed itself out. Uh, the committees used to have huge staffs, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of policy research researchers, real academics who could come up with interesting legislation, who could analyze uh, bills and, and come up with solutions that they could propose to their boss, to the committee chairman or uh, to the lawmakers. Uh, they got rid of all that. You look at some of the biggest and most important um, tax writing uh, committees, the, 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 the financial services committee that wrote Dodd-Frank, there's a tiny staff. It's, it's only maybe like 20 people or something. I might be getting that number wrong, but it's, it's a very small number of folks. So they have to turn to lobbyists because they have no one there to come up with, with interesting ideas or to really analyze big problems. And I think that's actually by design. And you look at the big think tanks in Washington that are supposedly academic and are paid to think, but many times, really, it's, it's, they're simply controlled by lobbyists as well. They're, they're funded by big industry. They take what the corporate, corporate interests want, and they give, a corporate ven or they give an academic veneer to it and then pass it to Congress. It. So yeah. the system is corrupt. And, and, and Dodd-Frank you know, has, has lots of problems. You know? it's, it's, we, we obviously uh, needed uh, financial reform after the 2008 crisis. But look, many of those rules still haven't been implemented. Um, and they're riddled with loopholes. So, Dodd Frank isn't the best example. Can, can I jump in actually for one last one? Sort of just of, of Mickey, as one of the founders of the Heritage Foundation, as I didn't know that that, that until the introduction. What do you think of what's happened to the Heritage Foundation? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me just say that uh, when my previous book came out be, before this one, did I mention I had a book? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, it makes a fine holiday gift. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a previous book called Reclaiming Conservatism, and it was about. How how, it is, uh, how the conservative movement has changed, uh, and so I tried to get uh, in front of the Heritage Foundation to give a talk about my book, and they didn't want to let me talk. But uh, I said, "Look, I was a 20-year founder. You can't tell me I can't talk." So I did, uh, and and they said uh, to the to the crowd at the beginning because you may not know the Heritage Foundation, let us tell you who we are, what our mission statement is, strong national defense, less regulation, protecting traditional social values. And I, I got up, I said, wait a minute, we wrote that in 1973. It said nothing about social values <laughs> in the 1973. You added that in 1993. I think, you know, especially now that Jim DeMint has uh, gone over to Heritage and turned it into nothing but a, a partisan advocacy group instead of a think tank. Uh, I think it's really kind of gone a long way from what it was set up to be. As long, uh, just as long as everybody's throwing one, I'll throw in one line for you as regards the lobbying question. The biggest problem as regards lobbying is that you pay for it. The fact of the matter is that the, the most, many of the most active lobbyists in Washington are entities that live off the federal largesse. They, they get the money, the taxpayer dollars, and it is absolute madness to have set up a system where your tax dollars go to a company that now hires hundreds of people, many former members of Congress, to come to Washington and to tell them to take more of your tax dollars and give more of it to them. And then if they've got any left over, now the Supreme Court has said they can use that to influence our actual elections. And so this is the crisis, and this is a little bit of what some of what Lee's talking about here. We absolutely should just say, you know, if you're taking big money from the government, you can't turn it around and use that money to ask us for more. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think you have to be very thoughtful about how, how you react to that. Uh, University of Arizona has lobbyists. Your hospitals have lobbyists. You know, your, your, uh, uh, your Chamber of Commerce has lobbyists. Uh, the Children's Defense Fund has lobbyists. The Sierra Club has lobbyists. So whichever, you know, it, it's not pure like it's just those guys. No. You know, I, you have and, and, to decide how much. But that's, that's why I do think that those yeah. who are taking huge amounts of our tax money, we might want to have some sort of oversight on that as regards what they use <laughs> our tax right. dollars to demand. Right. But we have time for one more question, sir. Okay, uh, gentlemen, I, I really appreciate your, your truth telling, your points of view, and, and Mr. Nichols, I appreciate the, the uh, you know, your optimism regarding movements to amend the Constitution, but. Yeah. I'm reading essays by Gore Vidal going back to 1975, right now, and in which he says exactly the same things that all of you guys are saying now. And to summarize, he says, we have one party in this country, the money party, and it's got two branches, the Democratic and the Republican branches. He gives them different names. So 
Here we are, it's 40 years later. In reality, what has changed and why hasn't it really changed? And I will go back to my seat now. Well, if, if the panelists yeah. want to just give a one-liner, if you can, to it, that uh, question. It's uh, changed. Mark. It's the really, really, really big money parties now. It changed, it got, it changed for the worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey. Well, no, uh, uh, Citizens United uh, was, was big uh, in, ch in changing things. There's also changes in our culture. Uh, you know, uh, in our universities, I know I'm sitting in a great university. Our universities have become all Votech schools. They teach you how to earn a living, but they don't teach philosophy and art and literature and, and you know, things about the humanities and how to be a citizen instead of just a cog in the economic machine. You know, we have more and more people uh, because of, of the cable shows who, who hate the other side. They don't just disagree, they hate. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that are to blame here. John? I'm a Quaker. <laughs> wow, that was a short one. Thank you. And <laughs> oh, if, you were born, cover. if you were born an abolitionist Quaker at the founding of the American Experiment, you probably lived your entire life and died without seeing meaningful progress to end slavery. And yet, the Quakers from 1787 on kept banging away on the issue. And they helped to form abolitionist newspapers and to form political parties. They got 1% of the vote and then 2% of the vote. And then they started to do more. And it wasn't the Quakers alone. I wish it was. But the fact of the matter is there came a point where this issue was made real. And my friend got up and said it's been 40 years. Well, it was a lot more than 40 years from 1787 to 1861. And the fact of the matter is change doesn't come as fast as we want. But change comes when we stop worrying about how long we've been working at it and start worrying about whether everybody in the room is on board and in the struggle. Because the fact of the matter is, if we want to fix this thing, we've got to all get to be structuralists. And the structure we must change is a structure that says, referencing this young woman's question, that somehow we can put more money into our politics but less votes. We ought to reverse that. 40% of Americans today register as independents. Change is coming. Yeah. Yes. And I think well, that, let, let's and, finish and with Lee. One good. last comment before we One close. quick comment. Um, you know, I think the, the, the question is right. You know, these problems have existed for a very long time. The issue is proportion. They've just grown so large. You know, it used to be if you wanted to make a lot of money, you became a banker or a specialty doctor or something like that. I mean, just think about this. Billy Tazen, former congressman, when he was in Congress, he tucked away um, a bunch of special provisions uh, that enrich the pharmaceutical industry. Um, when he left Congress, he immediately became a phar pharmaceutical industry lobbyist. In, in one year alone, he made over 11 million, I believe, dollars. That's more than the CEOs of many Fortune 100 companies. I mean, just think about that, just from lobbying in that one year. And think about his lifetime career earning potential. So those type of problems, of course, have existed for a very long time, but it's just so much worse now. Well, let's hear it for our panelists, that please. Happy <laughs> if you want to meet the authors uh, for book signing, you go to the uh, bookstore tent on the mall, the U of A bookstore tent. Thank you again for coming. And in just a minute, former Congressman.